I think I, I first met you a couple of years ago when you were introducing Lola, the personal virtual assistant associated with BBVA, the, the span, well, the International Commercial Bank, um, and um, got a, a bit of a schooling about sort of the, all, that, all that goes into, um, into a, a, an elegant, intelligent assistant. And um, I, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a little bit. Um, but just to get the names right, let's have each of you introduce yourselves and, and um, just give a little background, and then we'll get started. Uh, to you. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm Norman Winarski. Um, I'm the Vice President of Ventures at SRI. Um, my responsibility is helping create from SRI technology uh, ventures that include companies like Nuance, Intuitive Surgical, Siri, and many others. Uh, my name is Bill Mark. I'm the Vice President of the Information and Computing Sciences Division at SRI. That's about 250 researchers, um, artificial intelligence lab that spun out Siri, for example, a speech lab uh, that spun out Nuance, as a matter of fact, and a couple other labs as well. Okay, so, um, so it was two years ago that I mentioned, but um, what, I, what I came to understand is that uh, a lot of the work that we're talking about now started with a, an initiative called the Cognitive Assistant that Learns and Organizes, or CALO. And that would go back decades. <laughs> and, I, and yeah, could, could you chat a little bit about that? I'll start with Bill. Um, sure. To, so uh, CALO uh, was indeed a project uh, that SRI led. Um, it was sponsored by DARPA. It was... See, all this stuff starts with defense spending, so just... <laughs> it was probably the largest AI project, uh, AI research project ever. Um, we, and what year are we talking about? Um, 2003. Okay. Um, so this was a very ambitious project. SRI led a group of 25 univers mostly universities, a couple of small companies, um, to create a, an assistant, a cognitive assistant. And you can see that the emphasis was on learning. And th so Kayla was a big project. We did a lot of things, but the common thread throughout was learning. Just a couple words about that, and I'll, I'll be real brief here. Um, when we talk about machine learning now, um, there's this immediate identification with big data and statistical machine learning. And that's been an incredibly important development in AI and was something that we worked on some in Kalo. But the emphasis on Kalo was what we came to call learning in the wild, which means learning in an interactive environment, not looking at reams and reams of data, but learning the way a real human personal assistant would learn, which is through interactions with that person's boss and the other people they had to work with. So um, I think we made some fabulous progress in Kalo, but that's still quite a frontier in technology. And was that the biggest technological challenge? Or <laughs> there were many. Yeah. So I think the biggest challenge, interestingly, um, had to do with user experience. Mm. What's it like to deal with a system that learns? Um, this is a non-trivial problem because uh, I, I don't know how you feel. I feel, feel. like I saw the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but when I, when I use almost any interface, when things change, that's kind of uncomfortable for me because I'm out of control. Um, with respect to it. And we had to think very hard about what would be useful learning, something that was understandable, comprehensible to the user, something they could ask questions about, and by the way, something that did the right thing almost all the time. That's a real challenge. And then, so parallel with this, so that's at a, in a technology realm, but, but um, 
I think what we're learning and demonstrating here is we're talking about the sort of the business value. So was there, a, uh, Norman, a, a parallel sort of business track that, that you had your eyes on that um, right. these so, became relevant to? So there's one missing element of the technology realm before I go into the business, and okay. I think Bill should bring it up. Kalo was the most recent prior to Siri um, uh, program, this major program with DARPA. Um, there were decades prior to that, and maybe you should just briefly sure. re reference those. So interestingly, so um, in the press, and, and I think correctly, Kalo is, is seen as kind of the, the birthplace or the birth environment for Siri. That's true. The, um, the people who started Siri came out of the Kalo team. However, um, the actual technology that was kind of the the progenitor of, of Siri was way before Kalo. It's stuff that SRI and other places had been working on for decades, as Norman just said. The core speech technology, the core natural language technology, the technology behind doing the reasoning and, and representing the knowledge was stuff that certainly from the 80s and beyond. Right. So, so then, Dan, to answer your question, um, at academic institutions around the world, research institutions, we're always working for decades on technology. And we're always looking for that, that point at which a venture opportunity might uh, emerge. Uh, so when the mobile devices were becoming more powerful than the earliest computers and more storage and more communications, SRI, uh, with a team that involved and, and was led by Bill and myself, began this initiative we called the ba Vanguard Program, as you just talked about. And the Vanguard Program was basically saying, you know, SRI has been on the lead for uh, basically every computing revolution, and the mobile devices were much more than phones, much more, the, the, these computing capabilities, and our, what we wanted to do was be on the vanguard of the next revolution for mobile devices. That's where the name came from. But you can't start a venture based on technology, unfortunately. I wish hmm. we could. Um, we at SRI will only start ventures um, that we hope will be top tier funded by venture capitalists, billion dollar market opportunities, great teams, and the like. Uh, other, we won't, otherwise, we won't ignore them. We'll start, we'll do licensing of the technology, which is the bread and butter of what SRI does. But to create a venture is a very high goal. So what, what can you do with all this great technology? And there was no real concept of virtual personal assistant yet. And so we knew also mobile phones had Two major uh, revenue sources in digital sources at the time, two, text messaging and ringtones. Mm. Those were the primary applications for mobile phones. And so we said, what can you do? What are the applications that you can do for um, assisting the human who are working, uh, using the mobile devices? And so we came up with a series of actually half a dozen and then we went around the world talking to dozens of companies, mostly telecom, handset companies, and the like, and began exploring what those opportunities might be. Um, after doing multiple types of interactions, we finally came up with what would be the first implementation uh, of Siri. I'll That's just, how it began. I'll just add, um, actually very apropos of the talk we just heard, the, the premise that we had in Vanguard was, as Norman just said, that, that there were lots of services, digital services, that a mobile platform could provide. But the barrier was they were too hard to use. Right. So again, looking around, some of you I'm sure remember this kind of triple tapping to get that ringtone. So it wasn't just that there was a limited number of things. It was just really difficult for most people to actually access it. So that's what got us to think about natural language interaction and having users directly express their intent. So let me add to that, because that's a crucial point for how ventures uh, emerge. 
we do not start from a technology and say, natural language, what do we do with it? You know, there's a breakthrough there. What, how can we do it? Instead, you start with a market problem that says access to web services is a pain point, mm -hmm. such as we heard earlier. And access to those web services, point and click, 20% of the market was being lost for every click. <clears throat> and therefore, we wanted a zero-click solution to accessing web services, and that's how Siri got invented. And there's good news and bad news there, because Siri comes out, and, and people think mobile, they think mobile, speech, you talk to the thing, that's how you cut right. through. And, and um, so how important did natural speech <laughs> turn out to be, and, and you know, do you regard that as a good thing, or? or? Oh, I, yeah, well, so, as Norman said, we were going around talking to a lot of different people uh, around the world, actually. Uh, people in the telephony ecosystem, meaning network operators, handset makers, uh, people in the services. And a fair number of, I won't say the majority, but a, a fair number were adamant that people would not talk to their phones to get uh, services. Um, this is a, they thought that people would be resistant to doing that. Um, There's I have, still a fair number of people I'm believing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I always felt the opposite. I mean, <laughs> personal opinion, um, especially, again, we were saying before that mobile devices means a lot of different things. But if we're really talking about a phone, people are very used to talking to a phone. I think they can make the jump from talking to another person to talking to a system, especially if it acts something like a person. But the, so I think that, that um, natural interaction through speech was crucial, not that you always have to use speech. And what we're seeing now, you mentioned the Lola system, is looking at environments where, or services, where what people want to do is fairly complex. You mentioned banking, Lola is a banking system. It's extremely rare that a customer will express their intent in a single utterance. Hmm. And it's not, so one reason is that the utterance would just be too long. Um, but I think a more important reason is that when we have a conversation in that kind of environment, it's a discovery process. We're learning what we want. We're learning exactly what we want as we talk. So I'll just give one example and then I'll, I'll stop. So. Um, we just launched a spin-off called Casisto, which is also in the banking space. To give you an example of the kind of thing they handle, uh, a customer says, I want to pay my credit card bill. And the system comes back, like most systems would, uh, from which account. And here the customer can say, uh, gee, what does my checking account look like? Or things like that. You notice that was not an answer to that question. That was another question. And Obviously, the customer is trying to figure out, do I have enough money in my checking account to pay it? And then, so they're, pretty soon they're going to say, what's the minimum payment? Okay, when does it do, right? So it's a conversation. And, and it anticipates and attracts context, and that's kind of cool. <laughs> it requires understanding of context. And, and we've talked finance, but you know, my understanding, you know, Siri was a spinoff. Uh, you mentioned Casisto. There's Tempo. Tempo, I mean, what? Desti. <laughs> Coato. Yeah. Um, so it's good news for everybody here in the audience because uh, we have just begun virtual assistants. Well, this is, expand a little. So that's, Tempo is was kind of based on me, Yeah, so <laughs> Tempo is um, uh, named after uh, as a smart calendar. And its, its purpose is to give you insights in who you meet and what your day is like in the tempo of your daily life. That's where the name came from. I'm on the board of Tempo. And it's mostly about predictive learning, namely no questions at all. This goes back to what is a personal assistant. In this case, in Tempo's case, it's all about learning about you and your daily life through what is the most important element of your life, which is the calendar. You know, so if calendar hasn't changed for about 5,000 years. This is <laughs> the first time we're using calendar, wrong, as yeah. Lloyd would say. Uh, to understand the intent that you have every hour. Then there's Desti, which we started. That was recently acquired by Nokia. 
Desti is a travel company um, and consumer travel. It was meant to allow you to express your desire of where you'd like to be and what you'd like to do and answer it more uh, directly. Um, and uh, then there is uh, Kawato, which was a gaming company. If you're in the middle of a game and you want to learn about math or whatever, you can have a dialogue about that. You could have your assistant play the game for yeah. you. <laughs> and you can imagine that there are um, multiple, comp and then, uh, uh, multiple companies that we can create in market verticals, which opens up a question for, um, for everyone. And in fact, it's an open question in the world today which is, do you really have to create personal assistance per industry or per company? Or do you have the ability to do one that can serve okay. everyone? Yeah. So let's make this our first audience poll and invitation to comment. Um, I call it the sort of one to e pluribus unum. for, <laughs> Or is it going to be pluribus e unum? <laughs> um, how many think that all that's needed is going to be one personal assistant. It, it, it may not be this. It may be your watch. It it's may be some other. Her, word. maybe. Right? Her, right. We've seen that the movie. movie. Her. Um, that, that is your personal assistant for accomplishing your goals. Let's have a show of hands, and I'm going to go like this. Looks like. Not me. Five percent. <laughs> right. OK. Um, so and and. Well, then you have to ask the flip side. How many think there'll be multiple thousands? Well, actually, let's do it this way. Uh, thousands? <laughs> OK, there's large. Uh, hundreds? And then six. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, so where do, where do we stand on well, this? Can I, can I just say, I think yeah. we're um, we're talking about different kinds of assistants. Okay. So the your personal assistant is, this is the one case, um, is someone who presumably knows a lot about you and, and your habits and desires, mm -hmm. right? The other kind, in fact, um, we started to use the term virtual specialist, okay? Because if you look at, at the LOLA system you referred to, or what Casisto does, or Desti, or any of those, they're not acting like an assistant, okay? My, uh, actually have a real assistant, she's extremely good, but when I walk into a bank, that's not the kind of interaction I have. When I walk into a bank, I expect the person in the bank to know more about banking than I do, and to guide me to, I mean, I know they work for the bank, but I'm expecting them to guide me to fulfill my intent. That's a specialist. I think if, if we take a real world model, there will be many specialists. Is it 100 or 1,000? I don't know, but there will be a lot of them. You, there may still be one that represents you and may even interact with a specialist, but that won't be a specialist. Yeah. Well, that's what I like, is, is have your assist, have my personal assistant call the, the But in right real life, that, that doesn't have, I mean, yeah. my personal assistant does not do my banking for me. So there's going to be, in the world, um, multiple opinions on this. There isn't, you know, my opinion, Bill's opinion, we're going to talk, we should, I see hands, so we should answer them. But I just want to make one comment. Um, I believe this word that Bill used just now, virtual specialist, is crucial. If you ask Siri today, get your Siri, get your iPhone out and ask Siri, you know, uh, what's the balance of my bank account or something like that? I'm not sure what the answer will be, but it will be your local. It'll take you, know, you to Wikipedia. It'll take you to, <laughs> yeah, or your, or, or some location of the nearest ATM or something like that. It will not have your balance, and you don't want it to, because to access your personal information like that and your balance and your, uh, uh, your information is deep in the bank, and the bank is going to make sure that that's not easily accessible for anybody. Secondly, there are bank rules associated to that. Oh, you know, if you're asking why you got a fee in a bank, there's going to be rules associated to, oh, can you forgive the fee, and so on. I believe that specialists, the banks will allow, in fact, they have to. And, and just to answer Dan's question earlier, I believe there'll be millions, millions of assistants. In fact, I think that every enterprise will have to have one that's dedicated to themselves. 
but that will also allow access to their information, their rules, and the like. So, sorry, just wanted my little. Let the audience. Uh, yeah. Opine. Audience participation. Judy. Yeah. Yeah. This really raises a question for me, which is about virtual assistant APIs and how virtual assistants will be able to work with each other. This the, and the reason I ask this question is there's a fellow named Doc Searles who has been going on for a couple of years now about something called VRM, Virtual Relationship Manager. Yeah. The idea is that we would have our own digital assistant that would be able to interface with everyone else. This is really right up his alley. And along the conversation that we're having, if we're having millions and I have one of the two different kinds, how will they interface? Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm a believer. Um, I think it, <laughs> we, this includes me, uh, use the term API very broadly. Um, there has to be some way for assistants to talk to each other. I mean, that, that's already being worked on. But the, the hard part is how I have this, this multi-turn conversation automatically between my assistant and some other specialist assistant. Mm -hmm. That's a very hard technical mm -hmm. problem right now. So just to add to that, if you think of Siri, that's you know Apple's representation for you, and Google Now for Google, and Nina, and, and Casisto, and all of these, I think, and I agree with this, um, there will be one for you eventually that has to interact with all the others. Imagine, take another example. I personally believe that, uh, inter that assistants will not be you know, at all captive to uh, mobile devices. They're kept, they could be in the Internet of Things, your thermostat, your smoke alarm, everything. So take an example of you walking into your house. Well, okay, turn off the alarm, turn on the lights, um, you know, change the settings in the thermostat, and so on, and so on. You do not want to do that yourself. So there needs to be a, my virtual assistant, my VPA, talking and accessing all the other in, in, in a way that is seamless and without and efficient um, and, and very accurate. I, I think that's great and will work spectacularly for what I would call uh, simple, intense, or repeated things that happen all the time. But just to take, I mean, you mentioned retail. Um, David. Yeah. The, <laughs> the, the question is, um, would you, so I get that I want my, um, my own personal assistant to be able to interact with various retail assistants to do various things like maybe set up delivery and things like that. But do I want that assistant to shop for me? Okay. Do I, in my personal life, have a personal shopper that buys my clothing? Obviously not. But mo <laughs> most... <laughs> we weren't going to say anything. But. Most people don't. <laughs> right, and, and the reason is because the, those decisions are very contingent um, on seeing what's there right now, how I feel at the moment. I, I just don't think that we're anywhere close to getting that into an automated mm -hmm. interaction. And, and there's a company that, that's not here. Um, Artificial Solutions actually had yeah. announced um, yeah. the uh, virtual agent network yeah. sort of model, right. which, which makes a certain amount of sense because it gives you a way to define some domains. Yeah. Um, there is some standard, there are standardization issues and oh, things right. like that. Huge. The other thing about virtual assistants, just to add, and, and love everyone's feedback here, is uh, we're talking about language here. Yeah. Back and forth conversation and interaction. That, that is not my opinion of the future uh, exclusive mode for interacting with virtual assistants. Uh, they're about learning and understanding, they're about talking. Um, a virtual assistants will have vision associated to them. They already are in your thermostat with Nest. You know, walk by, it's easier. <laughs> your mobile device will become the center for all of the sensors on your body to interact with your virtual assistant and give information that relates to where you are, what time it is, where you're going, and your calendar. and. You know, humans have five senses, and, and, and your virtual assistant will have five million or 5,000 senses, <laughs> sensing scary. everything about you in the world. So including vision, including other fields of artificial intelligence, and that's what uh, we're, we're, we are working on right now. Yeah. 
And I think that that will be combined with conversation, because this gets into this issue of anticipation, which is something we've worked on in Kalo and, and is worked on many places. But just going back to, to clothes shopping, it would be fine for a specialist to say, oh, here's something, here's something you're really going to like. Okay, here's, here's a pair of pants you're really going to like. I need to be able to have a conversation about that. I'm not just going to say yes or no, and I'm not going to automatically have it delivered to me. Yeah, which, God, I'm having this flashback to my childhood. If, if I started whining, my, my mom would say, you're just hungry. And, and, and there is this model for interaction where you just say, I am hungry, and, and yeah. your sensors will know what's in the refrigerator, what you like to cook, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, more questions for, for, for Bill and Norman? Wait, wait for the mic, though. When you think about the experience for virtual assistants, and I'm Brian Whitman from Nuance, um, what is your take on gender, personalization? Um, can you give me your take on that? And do you think that they would all have to be similar if I have 25 in my life? Would mm. I set the expectation to it for them to be a middle-aged female or a male? Could you tell me your thoughts on that? Um, this, this is something we've, we've looked at a lot. Um, speaking of Kalo, we looked at it a lot in Kalo. First of all, I think it's a pretty complex issue, so I don't think there's going to be an easy answer one way or the other. I always use um, real-world examples to base it on. So um, I would say no, I would not want a, a homogeneous kind of environment. It wouldn't be very much fun, and it wouldn't be very natural. I would, I would want the bank specialist to have some gravitas and, and just have an air of authority. Retail, probably not so much. Entertainment, again, probably not so much. So um, I think there'll be a variety. And I think, as we're already starting to see, that will be to some extent settable and customizable. I'll have, I'll have a fair amount of say over the persona of my assistant in any given area. And by the way, if you have multiple ones, I think it's important to have multiple personas because otherwise you get confused. Who's talking to me right now? <laughs> Which of the voices? Yeah. <laughs> but, and, and we'll also hear um, that it's linked to, to branding and, and that sort of thing. But we, we have David. Hi, just a quick question. When we see it, do you really want your, your personal assistant to have to just learn from you when it can learn from the brand that should know itself best so that that kind of collective intelligence gets absorbed into your, your VA? What, what do you see? Because I believe it's more of an umbrella where your VA can bring that knowledge in from the brands you want to interact with, but use the collective knowledge that's learned from all the other customer interactions, not just yours. I, personal opinion, I think it depends on what it's trying to learn. So one, one of my pet peeves is that we, again, I'll include myself, we use this term personalization very broadly. Mm. And when I say that, what most people have in mind is, the kind, you know, think about Netflix or Amazon where it's going to recommend books or movies to me. But what's really going on is it's, it's using a big data approach. It's putting me in a category. It's saying people like you tend to like this, okay? There's other kinds of personalization. I'll, I'll stay with the retail store. If I walk in and I say I want a pair of blue jeans, okay, the clerk is going to immediately form an opinion of me and how much I know about blue jeans. If I walk in and I say I want, you know, tailored boot cuts in LA blue, that's going to form a different impression. That's personal to me. That's, that's little data, not big data learning. So I, I think you need both. Mm -hmm. Derek? Oh, gotcha. I have the mic already, thank uh -huh. you very much. Uh -huh. I was just wondering if, um, as people kind of know that they're talking to a machine, maybe we should be you know, shamefully true by saying that it actually is a machine and it's a persona really that important. Yeah. That's a great question, this whole learning. Um, who are you talking to? What are you talking to? Well, again, I, I'll give you, again, I think this is a pretty complicated issue, but I will give you my opinion. And I, I can also tell you the opinion of our customers that we built these things for. They want it to be extremely clear that you're talking to a machine. 
In fact, as some of you sitting here know, we could actually do a lot better in language generation and in text-to-speech than we actually put into these systems. So it's designed to show you that you're talking to a machine. I happen to think that's very important. And one more thing on that. Um, I'm a great believer in instead of having a, um, a vivid pictorial image to instead have more of a caricature or cartoon image because I think it conveys that you're not talking to a person. I like that. So I'm not so sure. Um, the, um, you know, what is it? In the late 60s, early 70s, there was a virtual assistant, maybe the first that was trying to, em Eliza was mm -hmm. uh, the system, trying to emulate a psychiatrist or a psychologist. And it was remarkably simple and remarkably compelling. The simplicity was, uh, uh, you know, someone goes to them and says, you know, I'm, I'm not happy today. And then it would look at the words not happy and it would parse them out and, uh, and say, why are you not happy? And then the person would respond and interact. And it turns out that, you know, you know, oh, the reason I'm not happy is I broke up with my boyfriend. Oh, well, does that make you sad? Or, you know, the, the discussion went on like that. And in fact, people really engaged. There are some people that went on for hours. And, and then, of course, there's the Turing test that people believe uh, that eventually a machine will uh, be able to uh, apparently at least be a thinking machine because Turing put the test in place that said if you can, uh, if, if, a, if a machine can function like a human and confuse, what is it, three out of four, three out of four people would vote that it's human, not a machine, then it is uh, a thinking machine. So I think some people really will want the human-like interaction um, and not feel that they're talking to a machine. And I think it's already happening. You know, Siri has had, obviously, its positives and negatives and a lot of response, good and bad. But a lot of people <coughs> really uh, enjoyed the human interaction of, uh, of the Siri dialogue. Just to be clear, I agree with that. But I think that it's our job to make sure that they um, understand the limitations of what they're speaking to no matter how much they want to believe it's a person. Yeah. It's a framing sort of thing at the outset. <coughs> Over here again. Oh, OK. Um, what, what technologies do you think will need to improve to get to the point where intelligent assistants can really have a meaningful conversation? Because I know that um, you know there's deep learning and cognitive computing and IBM Watson is really good at going out and finding answers to information, but you can't really have a conversation with it. Right. So I'm just kind of curious, what, what technologies do you think are, are needed to kind of get to that point? I'll, I'll just pick two. Um, <laughs> one I'll call deep knowledge, because people keep talking about deep learning. So we have to be able to represent the knowledge that is fundamental to human conversation. When, when we talk to each other, we do not fully express all of the information that's required to have somebody respond. In, in that bank example I gave, the system couldn't even have that initial response of from which account would you like to pay um, without knowing a whole lot about banking. It has to know that an account is something from which you pay. It has to know the different kinds of accounts. It has to know that you have those accounts. So getting all of that knowledge represented in the computer system is, is a huge technical challenge that we're working on. Second is there has to be an understanding of the dynamics of human conversation. We have certain turn-taking rules. We have ways of, we just talked about context, we have ways of expressing that. So um, if I um, say that I'm up in San Francisco and I continue the conversation and I, I don't have to keep saying I'm in San Francisco, that will be implicit in what I say. However, um, that times out after a while. You know, five or six sentences later, 
Um, I would have to once again say that I'm in San Francisco because we have this natural kind of timeout thing in conversations. All that has to be represented to do the conversation correctly. So let me let me just add the do conver I believe, and it's up to everyone to the world to decide that the the only way we can deal with conversation right now is market verticals. Mm -hmm. So if we stay within, you know, the market vertical of health and in within that talking to your nurse practitioner as as a virtual assistant, you kind of know, as we heard in previous talks, the nature of what people might ask, the vast majority, and what the intents are. And then you can have context within the dialogue and you can have a series of workflows associated to what people are going to want to ask and accomplish. And that's doable. I think, I don't know what Bill would say, he's the head of the division. <laughs> I think that's doable today. Um, if you try and do this across market verticals, and I don't know how wide those verticals are, but if you go across market verticals, I don't think that's possible today. And I think we'll get an argument among researchers whether it is or not. I think you, I think it would be very difficult to have, we just, the question was about conversation. I think it would be very hard to have a deep conversation across verticals, okay? To have a shallow conversation is probably doable. Yeah, so I think you'll start seeing the world of uh, virtual assistants start rotating around shallow versus deep. Yeah. And I'd heard it as deep belief networks too, uh -huh. so you, <clears throat> we'll get into that. Last question. What's your take on tooling and analytics? Do you think it's required to be in market? Do you think diagnostic type of, of reporting and analytics data is valuable to these virtual assistants or specialists? Um, I think it's valuable to the people who are buying the virtual assistants, absolutely. I mean, customers demand some kind of analytics around the interaction. They want to know what's effective. They want to know. Um, what we, we were just seeing earlier today, the economic argument for why you'd want some of these things, they want data around it, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Critical. I mean, I, I just said a second ago that there's this big problem of deep knowledge. I didn't say how that deep knowledge gets in there. So there's, <laughs> there's the, the AI problem of how, how you structure the representation of that, which has been worked on, again, for decades. We continue to make progress, blah, blah. But then in any given vertical, there's how does that get in there? And that requires tooling. A lot of moving parts. Well, thank Bill and Norman on our behalf. I thought this was <clears throat> very stimulating, good foundation for the rest of our time.